Well, since this is election week, uh, go ahead, Dan, put a uh, picture up here. Anybody know who that guy is? That's uh, President Jimmy Carter. I happened to be in Grand Rapids. Uh, he was running for re-election in 1980. Uh, Denise and I were waiting outside a library while the President of the United States was meeting with some big wigs trying to uh, win the election. Uh, he did not win that election, by the way. Anyway, when President Jimmy Carter exited the library, Denise and I were maybe 25 feet away from, uh, from me to Chad, away from the president. We were behind a rope, and there were dozens of cameramen and reporters, and there was a big crowd there. And I was right up next to the rope, and I recall thinking, what if I just ducked under this rope <laughs> and ran right up to the president and shook his hand and introduced myself? Crazy things run through your head, but it was. What, what would happen? How far could I get before somebody stopped me from just shaking his hand? Um, telling that true story to some law enforcement friends, they tell me you'd be fortunate, A, if you didn't get shot. Uh, for sure, you would get tackled hard quickly, and then you would be arrested and jailed for that action. But I protest. <laughs> I'm a citizen of the United States of America. This is my president. I meant him no harm. I just wanted to introduce myself, Henry. It just seemed like a reasonable thing. And then they explained back to me, that's not how you get introduced to the president of the United States. You don't just come running boldly into his presence, you wait to be invited in. You wait to get screened and searched. This morning, we're going to examine a section of God's Word that explains how followers of Jesus are allowed to approach Jesus. Can we just duck under the rope and run up to Jesus? What are, what are the rules? What's the protocol? Will we get tackled and arrested or even shot if we just run up to Jesus uh, unexpectedly? You know, uh, will one of the archangels tackle us or put us in, in handcuffs if we do that? We're in the very last three verses of Hebrews chapter 4 this morning. Uh, if you're able, would you stand with me? We're going to read them out loud. We'll put them up on the screen together. Hebrews 4 verses 14 to 16. Read with me. So then, since we have a great high priest who was Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Let's pray. Lord, would you help us this morning as we uh, dig into this section of your inspired book? Lord, thank you uh, that your word is alive and powerful and sharp. And I'm asking, Lord, that it might be that in each and every one of our lives. Do a mighty work in your church. We're listening. We're ready to respond. And, Lord, we just want to pause for the next few moments. And I just want to pray for our country. Lord, we are in a very crucial season right now. And, Lord, I'm grateful. Your book tells us you raise up kings and presidents, and senators, and Lord, you remove them according to your will. So we're asking even right now that your will would be done on Tuesday. We, we want you to know you're awesome. You're on the throne, and whether our people win or whether they lose, we just want you to know we trust you. You're awesome. 
So help us, Lord, to shine really bright for you, no matter what the outcome might be. And all the church family gathered at the Walloon Lake Community Church said with one unified voice, you can be seated. Last Sunday, Pastor Brandt talked about entering God's rest, Hebrews 4, 1 to 13, and how it takes faith, <coughs> excuse me, and obedience and effort and spiritual surgery to know and experience God's rest. Today, chapter 4, verses 14 to 16, the writer of Hebrews tells us what we should do when we don't know what to do. You ever had one of those times where you just don't know what to do? What do you do when the bottom drops out of your life? What do you do when you lose your spouse, the one you love, um, who was your everything? What do you do when your friend lies and betrays you? What, what do you do when your parent, your loved one, begins to lose their memory and dementia begins to grab a hold of their minds? What do we do when we're just honestly afraid of what's happening in Lansing and in Washington, D.C.? What do we do when every morning you wake up and there's pain? You can't move well because of a hip or a knee or a shoulder that's filled with arthritis or maybe it needs replacing. What do you do when a child or a grandchild tells you, I, I don't want anything to do with your Bible or Jesus or your church any longer? I, I don't even think I'm a Christian anymore. What do you do when you want a child, a baby, but so far, the Lord doesn't seem to be answering your prayer. What do you do when you don't know what to do? I'm happy to report God's Word has answers. Look at verse 14, okay? God's inspired book tells us what to do. It has answers for all of the hard questions. It tells us what to do when we don't know what to do, okay? Verse 14, we have a great high priest, <laughs> and he, our great high priest, has entered heaven, and his name is Jesus, and he's the Son of God. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. Now, this begins a new section about why Jesus is way better. That's what Hebrews, Jesus is way better, and we've already seen that Jesus is way better than the Old Testament prophets. Jesus is way better than the angels. Jesus is way better than Moses or Joshua. And now we're going to see that Jesus is way better than the Old Testament high priest. He's just way better. Chapter 4, verse 14, what we just read, all the way to chapter 5 and verse 10. Jesus is a way better high priest. Just pause. The Old Testament Jewish system of how you approached God was completely based on a sacrificial system where animals were sacrificed. Blood was spilt to wash and cover the sins of the nation of Israel. Most of you probably know that, okay? And the priests, those whose lineage were from the tribe of Levi, they were the human intermediaries. They bridged the gap between God and man. Holy God, sinful man, and the priests stood in the gap. Got it? The priests, one of them was chosen to be the high priest. Again, all of the other priests were from the tribe of Levi. So you couldn't be a priest unless you had the right Levi genes. 
I had to sneak a dad joke in there, sorry. Here's the high priest, sorry, I couldn't resist. Uh, outfit, Exodus 28, 29, all the specifics, if you want to go into detail. But they were to wear a turban with a gold plate on his forehead, a breastplate with 12 precious stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel, a tunic of fine linen, that's his undergarment, the top of the tunic uh, had an ephod with four different colors uh, on it, a robe underneath the ephod, and sewed in the hem of his garment were bells. I think this is interesting. So as the high priest was walking around, everybody could hear him. Don't you wish your boss always wore bells? You could know when to get busy. Okay, boss is coming. How do you know? I hear the bells. Uh, now, one time per year on the Day of to Atonement, today they celebrate, the Jews do, it's called Yom Kippur. Uh, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest, one person, would go behind the veil of the temple. They would go from the holy place to the holy of holies. We'll put a slide up, okay? Uh, once a year... One person, the high priest, could enter the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood of a spotless lamb on the mercy seat. What's the mercy seat? That's the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. He would be pouring blood on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. Why? That would satisfy the wrath of God through the sacrifice of a spotless lamb. You understand? And the high priest would be doing that on behalf of the entire nation of Israel and himself because the high priest, too, was a sinner. Okay? This was his sacred responsibility. And the reason that he would go back with bells and... Jewish tradition tells us, and it's pretty well confirmed, they would also tie a rope around the ankle of the high priest. Track with me. So while he was entering the Holy of Holies, typically the high priest was not young. They were often elderly. So in case the high priest died while he's back once a year, performing his sacred duties, if he died, they could just drag him out from behind the curtain and no one else would have to enter into the Holy of Holies because no one else was qualified to enter except for the high priest. Now just think with me for a moment. Knowing all of that, do you think the high priest took this duty seriously? <laughs> Do you think the high priest, before he enters into the Holy of Holies, do you think that he's, he's a little anxious? Do you, do you think butterflies? Do you think he was, oh Lord, I want to be right with you. Forgive me uh, of all my sin. I repent, I confess. You got to believe this once a year duty, this high priest took very, very seriously. For the Jews, the high priest and what he did here, that was their connection to Jehovah God. Okay? He was offering shed blood on behalf of them and for himself for all of their sin. Until 70 AD, that's when the Roman general Titus and the Roman army came in and utterly destroyed the temple in all of Jerusalem, okay? Since 70 AD, there's been no priests, no sacrifices, no atonement for their sins. Now, if you'll just think about that, that's a problem for observant Jews. Since 70 AD, they have no solution for their sin problem. They, they, they reject 
Jesus being in his shed blood as their solution to their sin problem. So it's a good question to ask observant Jews, so how do you deal with your sin? And they don't have good answers. The Hebrew Christians who this letter was written to, this is what they grew up with. Okay, Understand, the writer is writing to them. They, this was their religion. This was their life. They understood exactly the role of priests. They understood what the high priest did once a year. They got it. Okay, Talks about the role of the high priest. And they understood instantly what he was talking about. And now he's going to explain this is why Jesus is way better as a high priest. Okay, I'm going to give you four reasons that he lists out here. Verses 14, to four reasons Jesus is a way better high priest than the high priests of the Old Testament. First, put up here on the slide. Jesus is way better because as high priest, Jesus has entered heaven. Look at verse 14. So then, since we have a great high priest who's entered heaven, all the other high priests that have ever served, served on earth. They, they served uh, in an earthly way. But understand, Jesus rose from the dead Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, Luke 24, 51, and then Jesus sat down. Why did he sit? The work is done. It's complete. It is finished. Jesus is a way better high priest because he's a heavenly high priest, and the work is done. Second way Jesus is way better as a high priest is because Jesus is the Son of God. Look again, verse 14. So then, since we have a great high priest who's entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let's hold firmly to what we believe. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. He's God with skin on. He's not just man, Jesus is man, but he's also God. He, he's, he's deity. Jesus is our Savior, our Creator, our risen King. And here's what the writer says. Verse 14, look at it. He says, hold on firmly, hold on tight to your faith, hold on to what you believe, because tough times will test your faith. You're going to face Hard situations, painful seasons will rattle what you believe. Make sure you hold on tight to your high priest, Jesus Christ. Third way, Jesus is way better is because Jesus as our high priest is without sin. Verse 15, here's what it says. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Say it with me. Yet he did not sin. The human high priest needed to atone for their own sin. Jesus was without sin. Any other places it says that? <coughs> Excuse me. 2 Corinthians 5.21 for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. 1 Peter 2, 22, 23. He, Jesus, never sinned, nor deceived anyone. Jesus did not retaliate when he was insulted. 1 John 3, 5. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, and there is no sin in him, in Jesus. Catch this. Jesus faced all the temptations, all the testings you and I are ever going to face, all the different varieties, and Jesus never gave in to sin. 
Now think about it. You and I, when we sin, we might give in to sin fairly quickly. Jesus never gave in to sin. Being tempted is not sin. It's only when we give in to temptation that it becomes sin. Fourth reason that Jesus, our high priest, is way better. Jesus offers continual access to the throne of God. Jesus offers continual, come on in, access to the throne of God. Verse 16, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we're going to find grace to help us when we need it most. You remember the high priest back in the Old Testament? How often were they allowed into the throne room, into the Shekinah glory? One person, once a year, could enter into the presence of God. Notice verse 16. Notice, for all who know and follow Jesus, what's he say? Henry, come on in. <laughs> Come running in, come boldly, come confidently, come often, I'm available. We can approach our great high priest, are you ready? Anytime, anywhere, any place, for any reason. Now that should have an amen after that, but I'll give you another run at it. We can approach Jesus, our great high priest, anytime, anywhere, any place, for any reason, and that is, amen. Wow. We don't have to wait for anything or anybody anymore. We can go directly to the Father through Jesus, our high priest. And you just go, wow. Now, Luke 23, verses 44 to 47, you can, you can look that up if you want later. The veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. The veil is a very thick curtain. The curtain that separated the holy of holies from the holy place was literally torn in two, from the top to the bottom. Jesus opened access to the Father as our high priest. Think about it. Jesus just said, no, 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 the veil's no longer there. Come on in. Now, Hebrews 5, verses 1 to 10, talks about Jesus was not from the lineage of Aaron or Levi. Jesus comes from the order of Melchizedek, okay? Um, and we're going to camp on the priestly line of Melchizedek in Hebrews chapter 7 and Hebrews chapter 8. So you're going to have plenty of Melchizedek talk coming your way in the days to come. So we're not going to talk Melchizedek today much, but that's to come. That's to come. So here's my question. How does Jesus being way better as our high priest, how does that enable us to know what to do when we don't know what to do? Okay? That's nice. He's, he's way better. He's a better high priest than the earthly ones. But uh, how is this better? Okay? Track with me. The Lord Jesus never promised us that nothing bad will ever happen to me or to you or to your loved ones. Actually, those with the greatest faith in the Bible, those we read about in the New Testament who had the greatest faith were martyred and stoned and beaten and covered with oil and exiled. They had incredible faith. And really bad stuff happened to them. Jesus actually promised us, John 16, you can look it up, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. Here on earth, we're going to have many trials and sorrows, which is why the fact that Jesus understands, Jesus relates, 
Jesus sympathizes with, that's so wonderful. Jesus experienced betrayal and rejection. Jesus experienced crushing temptation, Matthew chapter 4. Jesus knows and understands us and our trials and our sorrows, okay? So our awesome high priest, listen with me, Jesus Christ says, verse 16, come boldly, come confidently to my gracious throne, come to me, Jesus says, and I am going to offer you things you can't get anywhere else. When you don't know what to do, come to me, and I'm going to help you in those times of need. I understand. I've been there. I've walked on earth. I get it. First thing he offers, he says, come to me, and I'm going to give you mercy. I love it. We're not going to get what we deserve We're not going to get justice, because if we get justice, we're all in trouble. Amen? Jesus is saying, I'm not too big and busy to help. Come to me. I understand. The Father and I know what to do to help you. So come running to me. I'll give you mercy. And the second awesome gift he offers us, verse 16, is what? I'll give you my mercy and grace to help us when we need it most. Grace is God's strength, God's energy to endure. Not that Jesus is going to deliver us from our circumstance. Jesus instead promises, I'm going to deliver you through your circumstances. I'm going to say that again because we need to get that. It's not that Jesus is going to deliver us from our bad stuff, our hard times, our pain. Jesus says, no, no, I'm going to deliver you through your hard times. I'm going to deliver you through your painful circumstances. Okay? What can we trust our great high priest for? He promises, you know what? I'm going to give you my presence. I'm going to give you my mercy. I'm going to give you my grace to help you when you need it most. When it's hardest, that's what I'm going to give you. Every time, any place, anywhere, that's what Jesus offers. Now, let's go back to President Carter. Remember, I'd been advised, don't just go running up to him, because if you just go running under that rope, you're going to either going to get shot or tackled and handcuffed and arrested. Don't do that. Now I want to show you a picture of another president. Hmm. Recognize that president? Anybody? Who is that? John F. Kennedy. And uh, I, I just wonder out loud, how come they just get to run around with the president? Why, why did they have to be searched? Did they have to be invited to come and run around the Oval Office? This is... Uh, his children, Caroline and John F. Kennedy Jr. At this age, everyone called him John John. The answer is no. (laughs) They didn't have to be invited. Why not? Because they're his family. They belong to him. He's their daddy. Listen close. Jesus has adopted us into his royal family. Jesus is is now our Abba Daddy. We belong to Jesus. We can just run to Jesus when we're in need. Think about it. Whenever you have a need, we're not going to get shot or tackled or arrested. He says, come on in. I'm going to help you with whatever you're facing in your time of need. So this morning, you're facing a tough situation, a painful circumstance, Here, here's what I know, according to God's book, Jesus says, come boldly, come often, come to me, my presence, my mercy, my grace is ready to help you in your time of need. And here's what we say, you know what, <laughs> Lord, I, I'm grateful 
I'm grateful that that's the kind of high priest that you are for me. Aren't you? That's our high priest. Come on in. When you don't know what to do, Jesus says, come. Come talk to me. My presence, my mercy, my grace, I'm there for you. Bow your heads as we close. Lord, thank you for being way better as our high priest. Thank you for tearing that veil apart. Thank you for allowing us into your presence anytime, anywhere. And Lord, would you remind us that whenever we're in a time of need to make a beeline straight to you, <laughs> when we don't know what to do, would you remind us, Lord, that you're there and you're ready to give us all your presence. You're ready to give us your mercy and your grace to deal with whatever you're, we're facing. Whatever we're facing. And Lord, I suspect that there are some of my friends here today in person, watching online, just don't know what to do. So Lord, we come running boldly to you. You're our great high priest. You're the awesome one. You know exactly the answers we need. You, you give wisdom. You give guidance. You give strength and comfort and peace. Rain down your grace and mercy upon all who are facing a time of need, even right now. Lord, there might be those who are here in person or watching online who've never made you their great high priest. They've never accepted by faith what you did in tearing the veil might today be their day of saying yes to you. Might today be the day where they're ready to believe. Jesus, I believe you took my place on that Roman cross. Jesus, I believe you shed your blood to wash and cleanse and purify me from all my sin. <clears throat> Jesus, I believe you took my place dead in that tomb. And Jesus, I believe you didn't stay dead, but early Sunday morning. I believe you literally, bodily, physically arose from the dead for me. For me. And right now, Jesus, I welcome you into my life. I welcome you as my awesome high priest. I receive you and open the door of my life. I make that choice to follow you, Jesus, right now, right now. And if that's you this morning, if you're watching online, would you hit that prayer button? We'd love to have a private chat with you. If you're watching later in the week, please contact us. We'd love to celebrate and get you going. If you're here in person, we've got a team back in the prayer corner. They're going to celebrate they're going to get you a Bible if you don't have one. We're going to get you going in your new life in Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for being our great high priest. Thank you that you're there with your presence, with your mercy and grace whenever we need it. And Lord, help us uh, not to just take that for granted. Lord, help us to take your throne room and every opportunity to come running boldly into your presence. We love you. We're grateful again for your book that tells us things we wouldn't know otherwise. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.